Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Welcome back to the show. I'm Zach. And I'm Andy. And we love talking about running. Yes, we do. And that's why we've got a podcast, so that we can just talk about running forever. (laughs) So, Andy, I want you to start the episode by telling us about your awful run this morning. It was wonderful and awful at the same time as a lot of runs are. I think you guys all get it. Um, Especially if you live in West Michigan. Yeah, you so it was get like this. magical and cool, but it was an hour and 20 minute run. So, like, the magic kind of wears off in the snow and ice. Yeah, and when you're a little slush. wet and you can't see and you're slipping around. Um, but yeah, it, it was one of those runs that was very informative, um, but also lacked a little bit in productivity, I have to say. I got the work done, but wasn't quite as quality as I would have liked. Two lessons learned. One is when it's an easy run, the point is the effort. So if you need to you know, control that effort a little bit more because of unstable surfaces, so be it. Um, just you know, maintain an easy effort and you've accomplished the goal. But the other one, Andy, were the strides. You were, yeah. you were trying to do some strides today. Yeah, I was trying to do strides. But I, I do think that I was able to overcome that by just doing quick feet so it wasn't an actual stride it was more just like trying to pick up light and quick feet to get my my form on track and my personal opinion on that and my advice to anyone in Andy's situation there is if you need to be doing strides in a given week um, if that's part of your plan remember that the goal of something like that is almost always running economy So you need to do it in such a way that you can really exercise uh, that neuromuscular activation, which uh, doesn't always happen well in a condition like that. So a lot of times I would just say just skip it for that run and try it again later in the week. Uh, But there there are certainly ways to still accomplish some of that goal, as Andy mentioned, too. So trying to aspire toward that. And that is certainly uh, the inevitability of Mm -hmm. West Michigan winter running, especially in December when the winter can't make up its mind if it wants to be wet, cold soggy freezing i didn't tell you this but on instagram i had like bragged about not having to wear mittens the day before and then the yeah. next day i was like oh. freezing my rear end off so, so it's your fault that I it guess. suddenly dropped 20 <laughs> degrees overnight no i'm not that important you can blame andy for today's weather in West Michigan, or whatever day it is when we're posting this. Well, so this episode, we've got some exciting things to share from the world of running, and our main topic today being one small change. There's so much that we can do to better ourselves, whether in the sport or you know in life in general, uh, but the psychology tells us that if you try to do all of it at once, you will fail. So... What <laughs> sounds mean. <laughs> well, that's what the psychologists say, okay. so call them... Um, Really, what's the one small thing that you could change and make a habit? And we'll talk about that after the world of running. All right, to begin the world of running this week, we wanted to start with some recent event results. And certainly as cross country season has finally, for the most part, come to an end at the collegiate and high school level, of course, um, not quite at at all levels. Yeah, because <laughs> next week we have some friends who are running in that USATF Club Nationals. Yeah, Very so exciting. USATF has basically like two big uh, national races for cross country. They've got the club one, which gets you kind of the team spirit thing. Um, you don't have to be on a team to run that, but um, you get a team competition. It's fun. There's no individual prize money, so it really is about incentivizing teams. But then there's also the individual USATF nationals for cross country. That's like in February or something. It's a, it's a really weird time of year. And then the World Cross Country Championships is like in March. It's just a. It strange. goes on forever and ever. <laughs> it goes on and on and on. There's a cross yeah. country race in the uh, Caribbean usually in January. There's one in like an international Zach's one. Zach's done just, that one. Uh, I did that one once. Competed yeah, for the U.S. for that. In a, cool. in a previous life when I could run on grass and not break my ankles. <laughs> so um, cross country, we've got the high school Nike Cross Nationals results. Um, and we just really wanted to focus on uh, Caitlin Tui, who defended her three time now national title in the Nike Cross race. And that's something. Yeah, um, what a streak. <laughs> what a streak. Sophomore through senior year. And so that's her final race. She did not win freshman year. And as a matter of fact, the stat goes, she's been undefeated since her freshman year. That is incredible. That's really something. Not not just because of the level of excellence, but because of the um, consistency. 
Absolutely. And, uh, that's great. So saying something for yeah, sure. Props to her. By the way, it was like the closest finish ever in Nike Cross <laughs> Nationals. The top three all finished within one second of each oh, other. Oh, that must have been exciting. One like like tenths dividing them. It was great. Wow. It was great. Well, I mean, I don't I don't know. Dive I there, through the grass and the mud. Yeah. The <laughs> the finish line picture is awesome. So that's that's high school, and then at the collegiate track level of course as cross country's ending track is always beginning right away and there's a reason for that um anyone who's run collegiate cross country you know that um you know you come off of that cross country season with a whole lot of fitness and if there were a track race right away it's not a bad way to try to qualify for like a national championship or regional championship or something right out of the gate when you've got that good solid cross country season under your belt so A lot of athletes do that, and there's no surprise this past weekend that the 5K was fast at Boston University. But how fast might have been a surprise? Because it was fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's just it. So in the past, the top few female times in the 5K for collegiate uh, indoor were like 15-12, 15-14, things like that. Well, in this race, three of them ran under 15-15. Wow. Uh, Two of those three um, under the second place time. And in fact, the one who won the race, which is Taylor Werner, ran 15-11, which is the fastest indoor 5K by a collegiate athlete. But she was unattached, so she's not going to get the record. But she, she still got a personal record. So yeah, there's absolutely. that. <laughs> and it's still faster than the Olympic standard for the 5K. Yeah. So like th- those are all good things. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, that's really something. So that's world-class stuff and, and a lot of it going on at BU. Mm-hmm. Speaking of world class, I can tell you a little bit about the USATF and their Athletes of the Year. Donovan Brazier. Donovan. Yes. Um, West Michigan's very own. You, we've talked about him before. We're pretty solid fans of his. In fact, Donovan, if you're listening or one of your friends is listening, we'd love to have you on our podcast. Yeah, our audience loves you, so we got to get you in front of them audio speaking. Yes. And Delilah Muhammad. Of course, because she was the female athlete of the year for the world. Um, She broke a 16-year-old world record while she was en route of winning uh, the 400-meter hurdle title at the Toyota USATF Outdoor Championships. And then she broke her world record again at the IAAF World Championships in Doha. That's really something. And we, you know, we, we just said that about Delilah Muhammad. Um, no surprise that if she was world champion, world athlete of the year, that she'd get U.S. athlete of the year. Well, well, we didn't mention this, but for Donovan, um, so we mentioned Delilah Muhammad has some of those records, and that's part of certainly why she was recognized this year. Donovan, uh, he won the gold in Doha in the 800, mm-hmm. which is something for a male athlete to win 800 meters. doesn't happen much for the United States. But um, also in an American record time, which was an old American record, uh, Great to see that go down. Um, But then as well, back in March in the U.S. Indoor Championships, he broke the world indoor 600-meter record. Yeah, you got to be real fast to do that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Congrats to Donovan. Yeah, so quite a a year for him, and, and we're really excited to continue following all of that. So the last one that we have here is not quite as positive or exciting, but um, certainly uh, necessary to mention Russia has now received an official complete ban. This is a four-year ban for all international competition um, Mm. because of doping problems. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It is. Um, You know, we're we're not excited when we find out that people are doing this stuff. But at the same time, we're glad to hear that they're being held accountable because Mm -hmm. it's really, you know, we need a clean sport. We need an honest sport. Um, That that question comes up in so many different ways. But there's certainly some some obvious things with like doping and stuff. So Mm -hmm. we need better now than later when they have to award someone a podium not at the actual finish of their race yeah, that's just and have awful. that moment stolen from them. So I'm glad that this is proactive so that the best athletes can compete um, for positions in a clean sport. Yep. So Russia's out for 2020 Olympics. They will not be present as a country. Um, however, individual athletes who have actually been honest and and qualify can still compete under a different kind of umbrella. Um, you've seen that in some of the recent Olympic Games, World Championships and such. But um, definitely still possible for those individuals because, you know, the ones who are honest, we want them to still be able to do that. But, yeah. um, you know, as a country, they can't trust any of the tests that came out of Russia's agencies. So anyone's being tested by those don't count. You have to be tested in a different an independent agency. So mm-hmm. we'll see. Uh, we'll see if they appeal it. And well, they will certainly. But we'll see. 
um, where this goes. It's a four-year ban, and then uh, it'll be reevaluated, and we'll see from there. On a happier note, some of you might be running in some festive races coming up. Oh, sure. It's the holidays. A lot of great, exciting things to participate in as a runner. We just did that Jingle Bell race yeah, in Grand was Rapids. Fun. Yeah, that was thanks, fun. Run GR. Yeah, very exciting. Um, I think they said, what, Kyle, what, what did you say, Kyle? You told us like 50 to 70 people was kind of the estimation. And then instead you had like 350 <laughs> sign up. So. That's Don't cool. quote us on those numbers. <laughs> no, that's, that's. I mean, those were the numbers that we were just like tossing out. But yeah, um, whether you know whether it was, it was so exactly fun. that number, it was still exciting. It was a fun time. We wore our Santa hats. Mm-hmm. We've been okay. So something about Zach and Andy Ripley is that we. This love is really being more festive. about Andy than Zach. No, no, we like to wear like festive socks. Andy and likes to Santa wear hats festive. during <laughs> December, and Zach won't admit it, but he really loves it too. So Andy bought me this hat. She's like, I got you a new Santa hat. Um, but she forgot to read on the label where it says this Santa hat was made for Goliath. <laughs> it was huge. I think it's for like a snowman in a town square. I think that's what it's for. I don't think it's possible to build a snowman that big um, unless you're know. in unless Antarctica. You're no, Elsa. Elsa. <laughs> we really Magical don't need powers. to ever have a Frozen reference on this podcast. Okay. Well. So maybe I'll just delete that part. <laughs> All right, that about wraps it up, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll have more for you next week. All right, so as mentioned, our main topic for this episode will be the concept of one small change. Yeah, so we work on one small change at a time that we're making into a habit. And the reason that that's so important is because the science tells us that once we do something repeatedly, our brain... That decision-making part of our brain goes in a sleep mode of sorts, and it doesn't use as much energy, which is fantastic Ooh. because who doesn't want more energy? It's good to save energy. Yeah. So as we take on one small change at a time, we are creating these habits, one focus at a time to help us improve our running. Yeah, there's a whole lot of psychology on this topic in so many different focus areas. But really what we're trying to narrow in here is the idea that there's so much out there that we could do to better ourselves. And as runners, certainly that's true. There's a whole ton of different kinds of things that I could try to do to become a better runner or even to just improve my fitness in a certain small way. Um, So that being the case, that's where the psychology comes in of trying to focus on just one thing, one small thing, turn that into a habit so that it then becomes self-sustaining and then I can move on to another small thing. And how long do I have to focus on it to turn it into a habit? Well, there's not a ton of agreement on that. There's certainly some kind of consensus that you need to sustain something over time with repetition. Um, I don't know how much time, but you know what? The idea here is you get it to a point where it is a habit and it's going to take longer and shorter depending on what the thing is that you're trying to change. So before we get into those things, though, um, I just want to mention that we kind of feel like here that there's essentially there's three anchors or three foundations that probably everyone should be doing to as well as possible, as effectively as possible. Um, And those three being uh, for distance runners, aerobic conditioning. We talk about this all the time, by the way, our our three part training guide uh, material and all that kind of stuff. So the aerobic conditioning piece is where the running um, foundation is built. So we got to We got to grow that and we have to do it as well as we can for as long as we can, building up to, um, you know, our goals ultimately. And then strength and mobility is huge. And that's going to always support good health. That's going to always support effective and efficient running. So we want that. And then, of course, just general health and well-being. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm sacrificing everything in my life to do this training stuff and my life's falling apart outside of the training, chances are the training is going to fall apart eventually mm-hmm. too. So I want to have those three things. Those are kind of our pillars. And then once I've got them, then the question is, what else can I do? What else can I change? Um, and the answer is a lot. So we wanted to try to narrow that focus and share a few of our examples, um, the kinds of things that we feel like have helped us or ideas that we might have for any of you listening. So my first one, just to start us off, is um, a simple habit, and I've mentioned it a little bit here and there, but uh, it's a simple habit that's really easy to do and can apply to a lot of different kinds of focuses. Um, and, and it's the idea of taking one or two of your runs every week and having that run be devoted to focusing on one thing. 
while you're running. And so that could be a mental thing. You know, I want to focus on, um, you know, thinking, reflecting, meditating on a certain topic or idea just to try to help drive uh, my focus in some sense, Um, especially if it's like a harder type run. That's not a bad way to do that. Um, It can also be more just introspective and reflective. I know for so many of us, running is kind of like a sanity thing. Um, You know, it helps to keep us anchored and centered in some ways to have that time. Well, let's be intentional about that. Pick one day, one run a week, and that can really benefit that. Uh, For me personally, prayer has been a huge component with that kind of a thing. Um, And if I if I can have that regularity like that, then it becomes something I can rely on. I love that one or two days a week running. It also ties really well with next week's episode. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to plug that here briefly because we've got a a phenomenal guest. He's going to revolutionize everything you thought you knew about running. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of. Well, he could. Um, And for some of you, you'll already be familiar with some of the things he's talked about because he's a local guy and we've mentioned him before in some of our materials. So I'm not going to give any more than that. We'll, we'll preview the episode at the end here, but, um, Really, using that one or two runs a week of focus uh, to focus on something with my form or my uh, running economy in some capacity, my cadence, my form, my posture, any of those kinds of things, it's really huge. Um, And this isn't something I would think, you know, every Friday I'm always going to focus on my cadence for the rest of, you know, time. No, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to turn it into a positive habit, just like we were talking about earlier. And once it is, then it's kind of self-sustaining and I can move on to a different thing. And I don't know how long that's going to take, but for me, you know, sometimes it's like a month that I try to devote to a particular thing once a week, and that's about right. And then the next month I can move on to something else. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, I just wanted to mention this because I brought it up in a previous episode. Um, Benjamin Franklin, who I'm not giving like some, he's not some moral example of amazingness, but Benjamin Franklin had this thing that he would do, and I mentioned it previously, 13 Virtues. And there's a website. It's 13virtues.com. It's all about him and what his 13 virtues are. Um, really, it's it's quite noble stuff. I'm not sure how well he implemented no, this. No, no. But the virtues like themselves, they're noble. Um, good things like chastity and honesty and sincerity and all that kind of stuff. And the whole point is he had this habit of I want to I wanna best myself by practicing these virtues. But the way he would go about it was he would devote one or two virtues at a time for like two or three weeks. And he would just focus on how can I do something today to better that virtue? Um, and I think that's that's a great example of this concept in practice, just in general in life. Um, I just think if you're going to approach that at the, from that standpoint, do it better than Benjamin Franklin did. Yeah, good idea. I have a couple things too and um, that I want to mention because there are many, right? And I think that I've mentioned this in a previous episode, but the two things that I focused on for this training cycle was activation and mobility. Hmm. So starting those routines, it was laborious at first. Like it was hard to get myself to do these routines. Yeah, I can attest to that. She, <laughs> she was having a hard time to get herself. I was. I was because I wasn't used to it and it was taking a lot of mental energy because I was thinking, am I doing this correctly? Am I doing this well? How much time is this taking? But as I became better at it, Um, science tells us, and it was true for me, that I was able to do it with less mental energy and I was able to do it more quickly and with more ease and more properly because I had practiced it and it aided in my running tremendously. Well, I want to just ask a question and touch on something here because um, I think there's another piece about that habit that made it easier for you, which was the motivation factor. Oh, sure. I think once it was more of a habit, it was easier for you to motivate yourself to, you know, to just get down and do it. Mm-hmm. Now, my question, Andy, is this wasn't new for you. You knew about this kind of stuff for mm-hmm. years, for decades. Why did it change this summer? It changed because I wasn't able to run without it. Honestly, I have come to the point in my running where if I don't do activation mobility, I get injured. And also the level that I wanted to compete at, I didn't. I had a very shortened timetable. There were a lot of things going against me, so I wanted to do everything that I could do um, to, to help me achieve my goal. So one of the things I can control, because there's so many things out of my control, was my habitual work on mobility and activation. And I think it paid off. I mean, you you yeah. stayed healthy. You looked strong uh, more so than you have in the past. And that's that's all positive and influenced by those things. Yeah. So Adam Hamolka, you've heard us talk about him Big at plug. Endurance Rehabilitation. We'd love to have him on again soon. So please send us your questions. Um, we'll be talking with Adam soon. 
All right, so my next one. Um, so if you didn't like my first one, here's an alternative note. Uh, this is just another one that personally I think can be huge for any runner, any level, um, and that's a wake-up routine. So I was experimenting with this. Experiment's the wrong word, but when I was coaching high school, um, I started encouraging some of the high schoolers to do this because, as you know, um, especially just young runners who are new to the sport, um, young athletes in general, you know, they don't have necessarily the foundation of strength um, they don't have the muscle development yet that, um, you know, that tends to come with just time, age and experience. So we needed to build that, uh, with these young athletes so that they could be healthy and strong and, and whether or not it influenced performance, we wanted them to be healthy and strong. So I started this process with them and I would recommend it for anybody personally. Um, when I do this, I, my experiences in general in the sport and my overall well being are certainly higher as well. So the wake up routine, um, is no surprise. It's just the idea of, of establishing a really simple kind of routine that you can do. Not even kidding. Like minutes after you get out of bed, something that helps your body activate and wake up that helps to build some of the coordination and strength and balance types of things. Um, we know just, uh, from science on the sport and time of day and all of that kind of thing, that the morning is an important time of day for certain kinds of development. So we want to maximize that. Now I know many of you listening to this run in the morning. So you're probably already doing something shortly after you get out of bed. Um, the interesting thing is if you have this kind of like a wake up routine thing, it can help that run go better. So it certainly can help with that. Andy just mentioned activation and mobility. So make those kinds of things part of that routine and that would help. But then for those of you who don't run in the morning, this is especially important because you Oops. do. Yeah, Andy, here you go. Um, you do need something. Your body needs something to be as effective as possible of a machine. You need something in the morning to help turn on those kinds of gears. Caffeine isn't enough. Caffeine. That's what I use. Not. <laughs> yeah, that does something, but that's uh, not what we're talking about here. So um, let me just be super open and honest with you. This is something I really have to work on, this wake-up routine, because I haven't been doing it. What I do when I get up in the morning is try to fend off tiny little people, which are my children, one and a half and three and a half. And 31. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, and I, I try to get my coffee as I'm making them their breakfast, and I sit on my phone for like 20 minutes. So my wake up routine is not very good. It's pretty uh, immobile. Yeah, well, clue into this. Anyone who's listening who can relate to anything Andy just said, whether you're dealing with kids in the morning or you just, you know, sit down to a book, a computer, a phone, a cup of coffee, whatever. Um, think about your posture for a moment. What's your posture like? First thing in the morning. Oh, hunch. Think about sleepy. your awareness, your 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 physiological awareness. What's that like? First thing in the morning. You know, you're not you're not thinking about those kinds of things, and all of that is bad because it's encouraging a bad habit in a negative direction. So even if you get to your activity eventually, and you kind of correct that, and you can then fire things up and get started for the day, um, it's already too late if you've had some of the negative habit forming stuff happening. So this wake up routine idea is really just about really just about setting yourself. Um, on a positive path as soon as possible in the day. And it has a lot of other benefits. You know, I just mentioned that. But if you're a morning runner and then some days you don't run in the morning, it has the added benefit of still keeping that system regularity um, that we know routine and rhythms are really important for us physiologically as well, biologically, physiologically. So um, those are all good things. And it can all be accomplished with a simple like 10 minute wake up routine. Let me give you an example. All right, here's what I like to do. So first of all, I should mention this is always best if it's tailored personally to certain things that you might need. So Andy talked about Adam Hamolka and our work with him. Adam gives us routines um, almost every time we work with him for like a certain period of time. So it's like a three month thing. Do this kind of routine um, or do these few exercises in your routine. So whenever he does that, I replace certain things in my routine with those things. That's that's a key component there because I know there's a weakness I need to improve or something like that. So Here's what it might look like for me. And this is this is an example of what I were, was doing with some of the high schoolers as well. And it starts with, first thing, you lay down on the ground. On the ground, not in your bed. Don't ever do these things in your bed because your bed is too soft and it reminds you of sleep too much. So <laughs> get down on the ground. Don't wake up whoever, whomever is nearby. And um, I like to start with the air bicycles thing where, you know, you put your you put your hips on your hands and elevate your legs and then you do the bicycle above your head. So do the bicycle thing. Why? Because it shifts the blood flow. It, it gets your blood flowing in the opposite direction of where you're standing up. So it's going to move everything around quite a bit. But also it's just an easy way to start getting your heart pumping a little bit, just a little bit. So start with the bicycles, do like 20 or 30 of those. 
Um, and then I like to flip over and do something upper body right away. So I, you know, completely flip flop that and I'll do something like push ups. you know, something really simple. It's kind of mundane. Um, and then I flip over again and notice the thing here that I'm intentional about changing my positioning repeatedly throughout the whole thing. I think that's important. Um, it, it, there's no science behind what I, why I do that, except that it just makes sense with shifting around your blood flow, um, not getting your blood settling in your head for too long, all that kind of thing. So hmm, interesting. Yeah. What so a theory. I flip over, I do some push ups. I flip back over. And then I do like some bridges and I have three different variations of bridges that I do after working with Adam quite a bit on my glute and hip inefficiencies and weaknesses. So I do bridges regular style. I do bridges one leg at a time with the other one. Um, you know, I do like a kind of a hamstring stretch up over my head. So I do that. And then I do bridges with my feet together in the butterfly position, which is a super uncomfortable thing. Like it just feels kind of strange when I'm trying to do it, but, uh, it's been highly beneficial. Awesome. Yeah. So I do things like that. And then of yeah. course I throw in something core next because that's where I have, you know, I haven't really done anything with my core. So there's no, there's no, uh, huge, claim to any one particular thing there except that I like to do like um, you know some kind of like twisting and, and oblique related things as well as planks and all of that kind of stuff and then I jump into some hip specific things like donkey kicks donkey whips um, anything from Jay Johnson's Myrtle routine and if you're not familiar with that just google Jay Johnson Myrtle and you'll find it we'll put it uh, in our in our blog post of course we'll put some mm -hmm. links to that stuff too and beyond that if I do have any other specific things that Adam has requested that I do because of some problem or another I'll throw those in there at this point I'm at about 10 minutes FYI so um, a lot of times I like to end the whole thing with a small bit of a yoga routine from the old P90X yoga <laughs> so I, I'm a big fan of that if you've ever done P90X that, it's guys? all super difficult and intense right well I loved that yoga routine I could never get through more than about 25 minutes of no it. Zach's inflexible <laughs> it's like a 90 minute routine and I would just quit I'm like I'm done so anyway um, I like to do about five minutes of that uh, because it's got a couple specific activation things that are great for distance runners. Um, some things related to hamstrings, calves, Achilles, and glutes. So. so Zach just went through a whole lot of stuff. We'll put this on the post that accompanies um, this specific podcast episode. And you can find that at a to z running com in our podcast or our blog section. And uh, it will be labeled podcast 10. So you'll be able to find that there. We'll put his whole morning wake up routine there. Yeah, and if, if you haven't already noticed uh, from any of our previous episodes, every time we post a podcast episode, we include links and resources. You just go to a to z running dot com slash podcast and you'll find all of that. So hopefully that can be helpful to you. I'm actually going to be starting this wake up morning routine and I'll let you know how that's going in a couple of weeks. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. I need it. So, Andy, you got one more for us. What's your last one? Yes. And I have mentioned this too, but it's knowing my heart rate has been a small change with big rewards because I previously had been running my mileage too fast without knowing it. I based it on relative effort, but some of us, and I'm going to guess that many of you that are listening are like me this way. It's hard for us to know what is actually easy pace. We feel like mm -hmm. we're running easy. But we aren't actually in the range for our heart rate in the easy zone. Why is that, Andy? Why why do you feel like it's hard to do? Because I'm in the habit of always running a certain pace. And I think a lot of it does have to do with where my comfortability in my form is. And when I slow down, it, it hurts more or I feel like I'm working harder. But I have to learn how to keep my heart rate down. Um, mm. Yeah, we, we got We got to dwell on that a second because this is a huge thing that's overlooked in distance running training today, which is um, comfort in lower aerobic paces is really important. We talk about efficiency so much, but if you if you can't physically be efficient and comfortable at the lower end of your aerobic range, it inhibits you in a lot of different ways. So there's there's a significant need to develop that for a lot of us. And I'm, and I'm not talking specifically any one of you, but it's it's a common thing. So that could be the case, especially if like what Andy's articulating. Yeah. So that has been a big change for me to pay attention to my heart rate and then to follow that into making choices for myself that are going to be um, helping me complete my mileage and complete the required training for me. So uh, just a brief shout out here to Jen Wackerly and Pete yeah. Mumbauer. 
Yep, some of our friends. So you guys have been working on some of this stuff uh, in your training currently. We've talked with you a little bit about it, um, and it's just hard. It, it's really hard to look at a number and say, okay, can I get my heart rate down? Um, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel normal or comfortable. It feels like I'm just slogging too much. Um, so the advice that we tend to give as we're looking at that is there's definitely a line that becomes too slow. And that's when you cannot remain efficient and, and you can't remain in rhythm, you know, comfortable rhythm, then you're probably going too slow. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the kind of the point, And uh, I appreciated Jen asking us a question recently that kind of brought this out. Um, take a week and run kind of what is the lowest possible end of comfortable rhythm. Find that rhythm and then keep it and find out what your heart rate is for that week or so. And then the next week, try to go just a tad lower with the average, unless it's already low enough. So look at your ranges, know your heart rate reserve, find out if it's low enough, and then you don't need to keep going lower and lower. Um, But there's definitely a way to develop that if it is a struggle. So Mm -hmm. I certainly encourage that. I think think for so many of us, uh, we're looking at that pace data. We're looking at the feedback from our runs that, that tells us our pace and we're wanting that to be a certain thing. Um, and we're almost kind of sacrificing the optimal effort level for that kind of data too. So, you know, what, are, what is it that I'm really paying attention to? Do I have my long-term goals in mind? And can I trust that if I operate appropriately, you know, this is, we're talking about aerobic conditioning here. If I do this right, then over time, the pace will become faster with a reasonably low aerobic range heart rate effort. So that that is the goal there. Yeah, and there are other components too. And I think paying attention to your heart rate might help with this. At least it has for me. So like last night, I didn't get much sleep. And um, today during my run, the snow was coming down. I was kind of slipping around. My heart rate was a little higher. Um, And just noticing those factors and seeing how they affect me is helping me to realize I need to manage my my uh, emotions, my posture, and also pay attention to my sleep. So um, yeah, like today, I guess I can give you an example of how I reacted. And I was starting to get a little bit like flustered a little as I was like slipping around and just like relaxing my shoulders. My heart rate came down a little bit. So um, yeah, paying attention to heart rate and the external factors can help us just be more aware of how to react. So that concludes our main topic of one small change. One small change. Creating habits to help us perform better and live better. Yeah, there's so much out there. Don't try to do everything at once. It will uh, overwhelm you. <laughs> <laughs> overwhelms us when we just think about all the things and we try to tell you one small thing. So find your one small thing and whether it's some of the ideas we've shared or if you have something on your mind, uh, focus on that. Turn it into a habit. Make it sustainable. Give it momentum and then you can move on to the next. Another episode on the record. Mm -hmm. We would love to hear your one small change. um, Also because we're trying to continuously improve ourselves. So if you have a small change that you've made and that has really helped you in your running, please let us know. Share it. We've got adazyrunning.com slash episode 10 for the home for this episode. You can post a comment there. Or of course, I think we also have like social mediums Mm -hmm. um, who wait. Isn't a medium a person? No, no. A- at a to z running dot com, and then also at a to z running on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You'll find us there. Those are all cool things that people who are cooler than me know a lot about. <laughs> all right, so thanks again for listening because we appreciate your feedback. So many people tell us that they've heard it, and that helps us know that someone other than the two of us and our parents are listening (laughs) so we appreciate you next week we have dave hodgkinson a form expert and a previous coach of mine that will be coming on to really help us hone down on the one small form change that we can make in order to help us improve our running economy that is going to blow your mind so get lit for dave hodgkinson next week on the A to Z running podcast. Yeah. So if you want to hear it, make sure you subscribe and thanks again for joining us.